I was convinced that light doesn't actually slow down in water. And I thought I'd mathematically proved it too. But then I did the experiment and reality decided to completely contradict me. So I, I really am wrong. Since then, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out why light actually slows down in water. And the thing is, it's complicated and I still don't know. But Patrick, you know, like, this is something I've heard about like progressively over the last year at various different phases of like, now it makes complete sense down to like, oh wait, if this was true, then does that mean that you're perfectly canceling out what the wave would have been in this like strange packet? That doesn't seem to make sense. And then, like there's these waves. Hopefully at this point, you've seen Grant's beautiful explanation of why light should in fact slow down in water. Now that argument is based on chapter 31 of the Feynman lectures. And the thing is, I'd actually read that chapter before I did the experiment and I'd completely believed it as well. And yet I was still convinced that light wouldn't actually slow down in that experiment. The reason is that Feynman's argument shows that the phase velocity of light decreases when it goes into water. But phase velocity is not what most of us mean when we talk about the speed of light. Imagine that Alice and Bob want to send a message to each other, and they've decided that the best way to do that is by sending some light between each other. For example, Alice might send a pulse of light to Bob that has some prearranged meaning. When we talk about the speed of light in the setup, what we clearly mean is the distance divided by the time that it took light to get from one end to the other. We'll call this the information speed because it's how quickly a message could get from Alice to Bob. And I think that it pretty much intuitively captures what we mean by the speed of light. The experiment that I did with the LiDAR on my phone was very similar in setup to this. My phone emitted a pulse of light and we measured how fast that took to travel through the water. The result of that experiment was that the information speed slows down significantly. So this is the thing that we need to explain. But in Feynman's book, he considers a completely different scenario. Instead of sending a short pulse of light, Alice sends a plane wave, which is a wave like this. The thing with plane waves is they're not real. They extend infinitely in both directions and are the same for all time. They just keep moving along like this, which means that this wave has been here forever, before Alice and Bob even existed. People will often say that a plane wave is like a pure color of light, like a laser. But actually these aren't like lasers at all because lasers have to be turned on at a certain point of time and then they turn off at a certain point of time. Whereas this is like you had a laser that's always been on since the start of the universe. That's what makes them actually completely useless to Alice and Bob for sending messages. When Bob sees this light, he's not gonna think this is a message from Alice. He's just gonna think, oh well, it's the same as it always is. That's why it's not possible to talk about the usual speed of light or the information speed of light for a plane wave, because there's no time difference between when the light was at Alice and when it was at Bob. It's always been there. But for this type of wave, there is another way to define the speed. Look at one of the peaks and then look at how fast that peak moves along. This is what we call the phase velocity. In physics, we really like to talk about the phase velocity not because it's real or a good measure of velocity, but just because it's easy to measure. So for example, in quantum computing, we often were talking about like phase differences um, because it's really easy to figure out if a wave has been shifted like this because you can compare it to a wave that wasn't shifted and then you can do this like constructive and destructive interference stuff to figure out how much of a shift it was. The other reason that physicists love to talk about phase velocity is because it's far easier to prove things about plane waves and phase velocity than it is to talk about more realistic light. Feynman's proof is about plane waves and it proves that the phase velocity decreases. But usually proofs about plane waves generalize to regular pulses of light pretty well by using something called the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform in this case claims that any pulse of light can be made up of a lot of different plane waves added together. Here I'm gonna add a few plane waves together and look how quickly they basically become a pulse. So here's one, two, three, four, and five plane waves basically already a pulse. Mathematically, that is true, but from a physics perspective, I hate it. I mean, you're saying that this little pulse of light that I just happened to turn on and turn off is actually made out of basically an infinite number of 
plane waves that stretch out into infinity in both directions and have been on since the start of the universe and will continue forever. Like that just, that's just not true, is it? Let's go over the main idea of Feynman's proof and I'll explain why it's enough to show that the phase velocity does go down. But I'll also explain why I thought that that proof showed that the information speed stays the same. So here's the setup of that proof. Let's say I have this container full of water and I have this massive light here that's shining light into the container. If we just look at the electrons in the first slice of this water, we'll see that each of them is getting hit by light. We're assuming the light is coherent, which means that all of this is the same kind of light. You can see that first there's a peak here, and then there's a trough, etc. Now imagine that we want to figure out what happens to an electron that's further down in the water somewhere. If the other electrons weren't in the way, then it would only get hit by the light that's directly in front of it. But it's these other electrons being here that makes all the difference. And that's because each one of them is going to emit their own light in response to the light that's hitting them. Remember that happens because when electrons get hit by light, they oscillate. And when a charged particle oscillates, it emits its own light, which is in the opposite direction of the light that hit it. So you can see this electron light is in the opposite direction of the original light that hit it. Um, Grant pointed out that that actually isn't quite right because the electrons actually oppose the total force that they experience. And in this case, there's actually two forces they experience. So they experience the force from the light, but they also experience force from the atoms pulling them back to where they originally were. And so depending on which of those two forces is stronger, the direction of the electron's light may be in the same direction as the other light, or it might be in the opposite. It doesn't really matter for the rest of the analysis, but I thought that was interesting, so I wanted to point it out. So the light that hits this electron further down the line is going to be a combination of these two bits of light. Crucially, the light coming from these electrons isn't just going in the forward direction the way that this light from the lamp is. That's because when the electrons oscillate like this, they emit light in all directions, although most strongly in the forward direction, they also do emit some light that's, for example, pointing this way and going to hit our electron. If we just look at two of those pieces of light, you'll see why this is such a big deal. Initially, these two bits of light are in sync with each other. Even though they're still in sync here, it's a very different story when they get to here. The reason that matters so much is that you can imagine all of these electrons sending out messages, but because all of the messages are being sent at the speed of light, that means that some messages are going to look like they're lagging behind if they're coming from further away. It's the same effect as when we look into the night sky and the further away an object is, the more it looks like it's in the past. In the same way, some of these electrons are going to look like they're really lagging behind. We can see that when the light reaches this electron here, this light is at a peak while this one is at a trough. And so they actually kind of cancel each other out at this point. From the perspective of this electron, this light is lagging behind. This electron is seeing that light as it was in the past. So even though in reality all these electrons are bouncing in unison, from the perspective of this electron, it's going to look like actually they're not in unison and the further away electrons are further back in time. The overall effect is that the light is a little bit shifted backwards from where it should be because some of the light from the electrons is old light that is just now reaching the next layer. It makes sense that if a plane wave gets shifted back a little bit every time it goes through a layer of electrons, that overall the phase velocity would decrease. But what about the actual speed of light? Does that decrease according to this argument? Well, I didn't think so, because remember firstly that all of these waves are infinite. So we can't even talk about when they get to the next electron because they've kind of always been there. So first, let's just cut these waves short, which means that they're only approximations to plane waves. Now we can talk about how long it takes for them to arrive at the next electron. But this light coming from further away doesn't arrive as quickly as the more direct one. And so it will look like it's going slower than the speed of light. And that's just because it went on a less direct route and it takes longer for the light to travel that longer path. However, the strongest bit of the light, which is the original light plus the light from the electron in front, does go on the most direct path. 
And so it will look like it's traveling at the speed c. And so if this electron was measuring the speed of light by counting how long it takes until it gets hit by light, it would say that the speed of light is still c. Yes, it will experience other light coming in later, but for the speed measurement, all that matters is the speed of the front of the light, because at that point, it can confirm that it received a message from the previous layer. Here's another, maybe simpler way to see the same argument. I'm going to deal with just really simple light like this. It's like I turned this lamp on and off very quickly. I found it so confusing to the point of not believing it that light like this could really slow down in water. And that's because of this really simple argument I had, which you might remember from last time. So here's how it went. When this light hits these electrons, the electrons hit back with their own light. When you sum all of that up, you're going to get something. It's going to be complicated, so let's not worry exactly what it looks like, but it's going to be some light there. And this is going to happen for every layer. So whenever the original light reaches a new layer, it's going to jiggle all of those electrons and they're going to immediately respond by producing some complicated function of light. Another way to think of it is that whenever this original light moves into a layer, it immediately produces some light from the electrons. So we know the original light is traveling through the water unimpeded going at the speed c, and we know that it's producing this electron light as it goes. But when we're talking about the speed of light in water, what we actually care about is not the original light or even the electron light, but the sum of them together. As soon as this light gets to a particular layer, it will produce some electron light in that layer, and that will add to some resulting light. And so there will be some resulting light that's in this layer. So the resulting light is traveling just as fast as the original light did because they keep in time with each other. Think about it from the perspective of someone who is timing how long it takes for some light that was shone on one side of this container to get to the other side. They stop timing as soon as they detect some light. And because that light was just keeping in time with the original light, the amount of time it took for that new light to get across the water is exactly the same as if there was no water there at all. This argument seems watertight, but it's not. It's actually wrong. And we know that because the experiment showed that light really does slow down in water. Morning. So I spent a lot of time last night thinking about um, where I should go from here. But the thing is that as a theoretical physicist, I've hardly ever done anything besides, you know, relying on just pen and paper and mathematics. Um, I mean, I hardly did any experiments in my undergrad. I would always just try my very best to get out of labs. And so I kind of like, you know, didn't have that in my um, tool belt. And that's what this series is about. I, I wanted to like learn how to do experiments. But uh, now that I've done this experiment, I don't know how to interpret it except through my usual methods and that didn't work. Um, so I'm a little lost as to where to go to next. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and um, do some computer simulations of the stuff that I had been calculating. I, I had intended to try that anyway, um, but I thought it would just be a way to like confirm the things that I already knew. But now that I must have some sort of mistake in my um, mathematics, it would be good to try and use the computer to like actually explore what's going on. Um, but the thing is, uh, I don't know how to code. That's right. It's time for a learning to code montage. I wish that this was as easy as this video makes it look, but it was really not. But eventually I did get this working. What I did was I simulated Feynman's whole argument with all of these slices of electrons and I managed to show that plane waves really do slow down in water, which was so exciting. So the next important thing I needed to do was show that pulses of light do slow down in my simulation. Now, I was pretty sure that this was going to happen because this simulation is just based on two things. Feynman's original analysis of plane waves, which only basically assumed some stuff about electromagnetism, so that seemed rock solid. And then to upgrade that analysis from plane waves to pulses, I used the Fourier transform to write the pulse as a sum of a bunch of plane waves. 
And then I did the analysis for each of those plane waves and then added them back up. The Fourier transform is a mathematical fact. And so stuff based on that is basically guaranteed to work. I know I went on and on about how it's cheating to use the Fourier transform before, but I think in this case it was and it wasn't. Like, I don't think it was cheating because I just wanted to use it to confirm, at least mathematically, that this model would show that light slows down in water. Like, even pulses of light would slow down. But then, after I'd got that confirmation, I'd figure out why that happens without using the Fourier transform. At least, that was the plan. Except, my simulation just wouldn't work. This was supposed to be the straightforward part. If this wasn't working, then it means that there's something very wrong with Feynman's analysis. But I had nowhere else to turn. Like I'd read all these other textbooks and Feynman's derivation was the only one that made any sense at all. I mean, I'd gotten so desperate that I asked all of my physics friends and I even started like cold emailing a bunch of photonics professors. Yeah, nothing worked and I had no way to fix my explanation and even though I'd spent months and months on it at this point um, I started feeling so sick to my stomach every time I thought about it that I decided I just needed to give up on this project. Some months after I'd given up Grant convinced me that I should just make a video about this project even if it didn't work out and so I revisited my old code and it was terrible like I know I was a beginner but Man, that code was so bad to read. In fact, it was so bad that I just decided to scrap the whole thing and rewrite it in a few days. It's like midnight and I'm coding and look at this. Those waves travel pretty fast till they get into here and then they're just sort of, well, they're all over the place, but. <laughs> okay, let me show you the simulation that's slightly more convincing than what you just saw. Okay, this red light gets shone into some water and what happens is it continues going at the speed C, um, but this purple light is the new light that is resulting from the original light plus the electron's light. And you can see that that is going a lot slower. And you can tell because, um, see this dot here, the red one, is something going at the speed C, whereas these ones are reduced ones. The blue dot actually represents the phase velocity of the main frequency in this light, but the green dot represents the actual information speed of light. And they're a little bit different because there's a difference between basically like group velocity and the phase velocity. It's a little bit technical, but it's actually kind of cool that um, I can show you this. I've just changed the parameters a bit so the refractive index is less than one. And it actually is possible for the refractive index to be less than one in real situations. Um, but you might have thought, well, that must mean that the speed of light is suddenly greater than C in those mediums. But that's not true. The phase velocity is greater than C, but the information speed, or like the group velocity, is less than C. All right, so you can see the original light coming in, and it's still going faster than this resultant light. But here's something interesting. See the blue dot is going faster than all three of them? If you follow one of the peaks of the purple light, then you'll see that it's traveling at this phase velocity, whereas the overall shape of this light is traveling at the group velocity or the information speed of light. Here you can see this a little bit more clearly. The blue dot is going to keep in time with that first peak but the green dot keeps in time with the actual light. And what this shows is that even if the refractive index is greater than one, the information speed of light is always less than C in a medium. I guess there were just some bugs in my code because now it was working and the simulation showed that Feynman's analysis does lead to the conclusion that the information speed of light slows down, which is great until I remembered that I kind of already knew that the information speed slows down, right? Like from the experiment. What I wanted to get from the simulation was hopefully some insight into why. And this simulation based on the Fourier transform was giving me none of that. For example, it correctly showed that if you have a pulse of light going through water, eventually the new pulse of light will lag so much behind the original light that's traveling at sea that the two will become disjoint. 
The only way that this could happen is if the electron light exactly conspires to add up like this. So like the electrons have to make this crazy two peak distribution where the first peak is traveling at the speed c, but somehow the second peak is traveling at the speed three over four. Basically some of the electrons light has to travel fast enough to cancel out the original light entirely. And then some of the electron light has to be traveling at a slower speed. This is the only way to get around the argument that I made earlier, because basically I was assuming that you would never have this situation where the electron light cancels out the original light exactly. Honestly, that felt impossible. It felt like way too much of a grand conspiracy on the part of these electrons. And so I just didn't believe that that could be possible. The simulation based on Feynman's argument tells us that this must be what happens, but it gives very little insight into why, because it doesn't really let you directly see what all the electrons are doing. So I really wanted to understand this exact situation, not the one with plane waves, but with these real pulses of light. But the thing is, this calculation was just way too difficult because you have to imagine the effect of every electron on every other electron. And this all simplified down really nicely when you're working with plane waves, but it doesn't simplify nicely at all when you're working with actual light. And so that's where I got stuck. What I needed to do was write a simulation that directly models pulses of light like this, rather than using plane waves in the background. The problem was that that simulation would be a lot harder to write. All right, I figured out how to make my simulation stop blowing up, which is very exciting. So let me show it to you. One thing to note about the simulation is how painfully slow it is. I tried to vectorize everything, but uh, I couldn't get it to work. And so in the end, everything is just a for loop. What's happening here is this red thing is the light that's entering a medium. So the medium is represented by these electrons. There's actually 175 of them in this simulation. I haven't drawn them all because it gets kind of crazy. In fact, it's kind of crazy with them here right now, but I'll take them out for the rest of them. Anyway, what's happening is that you can see that the light oscillates these electrons and they jiggle about and hopefully eventually they settle back down, but who knows? Anyway, the more important thing is the purple line. So the purple line is the total light. Um, so it's the sum of the red light, which is the original, plus the blue light, which is what's coming from the electrons. We need that purple resulting light to be going slower than the red original light. But let's see if that pans out. First, let's look at the simpler case, or at least what should be the simpler case. So here we have the red light being a plane wave. And what we expect to see is that the purple resulting light should be um, like a smaller wavelength and also should be going slower. Right now, the electrons are acting completely crazy, like their light is all over the place. But that actually kind of makes sense because in um, Feynman's thing, he assumes that the electrons are in a steady state, but actually it takes a little while for the electrons to settle down. So let's give this a second. And now we can kind of see the behavior that we're expecting. You see how the um, purple light now looks like it's kind of lagging behind the red light and the gap kind of grows. It sort of does look like the light is slowing down, which is pretty surprising. I'll show that to you again so you can see whether you agree with that. And I'll take out the blue light because I think it's a little bit confusing and I'm going to speed it up a bunch. So for the plane waves, this just about works. At first, the behavior is a little bit crazy, but then it does settle down and kind of gives you what you expect, which is that the new light seems to be traveling a bit slower. It's a little hard to tell, but it, it looks like it probably is. And it seems to have a smaller wavelength. But for the pulse of light, I couldn't even get it to actually slow down. And I don't know why exactly that is. It might be because I just need to have more electrons in the simulation and um, more time elapsed, but like this simulation is very, very computationally expensive and I haven't been able to run it with like much higher parameters than this. So maybe that's it, or maybe there's something more fundamentally wrong. Um, 
So it's kind of hard for me to draw conclusions from this simulation at all. Like it kind of looks like the front of the um, original light is getting worn down by the electrons as they go through, which is what I suspected must be the answer. That like as the light travels through the water, at every layer the electrons just shave a little bit off the front more and more until eventually that original pulse just basically gets cancelled. I think that must be what happens and the simulation kind of kind of suggests that but it's really not enough to draw a solid conclusion about. There's still so many bits that I don't understand and it's very frustrating because I thought that if I wrote this simulation that has taken so much work that it would just give me all of the answers. Um, instead, I just have this thing that like frustratingly half works and I, I, I don't know what to think. This whole thing started around Christmas of 2022 for me and it's almost Christmas again. And honestly, I think it's time that I admit that I don't know why light slows down in water. I feel awful having to admit that on a video, but I guess I'd feel even worse if I made a video where I pretend I know the answer and it sounds right. But I'm kind of hopeful that maybe by telling you why this question is complicated and interesting, some of you might want to take it up. And if you do and you make some progress, then I would really love to hear about it. So yeah, let me know in the comments.